today's Charlotte Mason chit chat kind of is going from my car and if I don't seem like I'm all there it's because I had a root canal today and I'm kind of just all bleh right now between that and coffee we should be we should be sitting pretty so I've been doing this Charlotte Mason series where I just take little bites and I'm just kind of talking about them but there's a whole bunch of notes that I've been taking that I haven't been able to cover because I'm just trying to keep those videos really short which hasn't been easy I tend to talk a lot and I had mentioned in one of my videos that I would be happy to share with you um, just some notes that I was taking and some hodgepodge thoughts if that was something that you guys would um, like to see and there was a couple of you that said it would be um, your cup of tea or your iced coffee for the day so in that regard um, pull up a chair pull up a cup of coffee if you need to get dinner going now's the time to do it just it really is just gonna be a hodgepodge of thoughts and it all is coming from this book Parents and Children, The Role of the Parent in the Education of the Child, and I'm just going to kind of be looking at my notes and talking a little bit about them. Again, this is a hodgepodge video, but I know that a few of you were interested in it, and I hope this is helpful to anybody. So one of the things that I've really, really been struggling with is seeing the, the, the comparison trap but seeing other moms homeschool moms post how their children are asking more questions and being more observant and all these things and I'm sitting over here like why can I not get my child interested and one of the notes that I have in here is Charlotte Mason knew that all Charlotte Mason knew that not all children had the will to learn or to be discipled in education. She used this motto, I can, I am, I ought, I will, to train the children into understanding what was expected of them. You know, I know we heard that one. We've we've heard that motto a lot, I can, I will, I ought, um, and all that. I don't think that's Ethan, honey. And I loved learning about where it actually came from. So for those of you out there, apparently even in a Charlotte Mason education classroom, some of the children weren't all motivated to do the very best they can. Now, I love this motto. I've been trying so hard to figure out how to work it into my life. Like you don't just want your children to memorize those. So um, I actually have a question for you. If you use this motto in your homeschool classroom, how do you use it? You know, I've, I've seen it used with uh, Bible verses, and I really like that. Like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am a child of God. I will do everything to the best of my ability. And I ought to um, listen, learn, observe, etc. So I would love to know how you use that. But going into that, the goal of a Charlotte Mason method is to give the child a lifelong desire to learn all he can about the world around him. He should be eager to do so, but in order to keep him grounded and not a flighty fellow who does not have attentiveness or cleanliness, he should learn the habits that a good member of society should have. And I think that's so prevalent, especially today, because there is so much going around. All I have to do is take my kids to Walmart, and it's like, you know, and, and they're looking everywhere, and, and there's so much to see, and there's music over here to try to sell stereos, and there's movies going on here to try to sell, you know, TV screens, and there's noises going down here because of toys making noises, and then there's children crying over here, there's flashy clothes over here, there's so much, and they're overstimulated, and this is so beautiful to kind of teach... You, you, you've got to teach your children basically to start putting those blinders on. It's one reason why I hate taking kids to the grocery store. It has nothing to do with the fact that I think they're very undisciplined children or that I need me time. It's because that overstimulation is too much for me at times. And I don't want to put them... It's like sending them into a lion's den and saying, don't be afraid. You know, I don't want to put them in a position where... 
and making it harder for them to do those habits, especially as children when they're trying to learn. So I really liked some of those thoughts with it. And basically, yes, we we are training them. Yeah, some children you're going to have to train in these things. They're not. It's not going to come naturally. Some children it seems like it comes more naturally than others. But obviously there are still children that we have to kind of Mama. Um, disciple in it. But it, I mean, I love that. It's a goal to give them a lifelong desire to learn all he can about the world around him. I think even if my children were to choose one thing to let's say let's say medical field okay it's just easy and I can think about that but I would love if she didn't just focus all of her efforts and energy into reading medical journals I would love it if she desired to see what everything else was going around and to be aware of it and not to be secluded in her own little world and I love that because if you teach that lifelong desire of interesting. I have all these kids like running laps and I don't see that often. Anyway, if you have this lifelong <laughs> desire to learn, then I think it's a great thing to, to pull the kids from their bubble. It's so easy to become so self-centered and so self-focused. I'm raising my hand right here as well. I could easily become self-absorbed in my own little world of books so I love I love that uh, Charlotte Mason does want that's one reason why she does give a diverse um, range of subjects and ideas so that these children um, can get more of a desire for lifelong learning did you ever know that some seeds lay doormat? I'm sure most people do. But there are seeds that basically they get scattered and they lay doormat until they get watered. So they can be drought seeds and when a drought ends and the waters come down, those seeds that may have remained um, resting, sleeping for years can actually come back to life and they basically spring up and grow and do all their sorts of things. And it's kind of the same thing with education. You can plant a seed and it remains dormant. And at one point it will flourish when something awakens it. So even those feast of ideas, even if you don't see why something is, why something is being taught right now, maybe it's going to be a dormant seed or maybe it just fades away and never comes back. I still don't have a use for algebra, folks. But maybe it'll be like um, our economics that I didn't understand. And then it came in later and I flourished with it. Oh, it's so sad. I don't know what's going on, but there's like a bunch of, I would say, middle school kids like running this park, we're not even near a school. Well, I guess there's a school way over there. But there's just this one, just this one kid. And he's all by himself. I think he's got flip flops on. It's just breaking my heart. And he's just, he's. He's pledging along. There's like all these groups and he's a loner. And you can tell he's struggling. But he's going. He's going at it. He's doing good. I want to give that kid an ice cream cone. That is so precious. Okay. Some of the other thoughts that I had was this one, and it said, this is taken from page 30, that the child is not a blank slate to which we can't paint upon our masterpiece, but the child is God's masterpiece, that we do not hide his talent, but bring forth all that he is made for twice over. I just love that. This is, but I do like the fact that we need to have the devotion to um, 
really help our children. Like, we have to be devoted to that. And there's too often times where I'm sitting on the couch and I'm like, I don't care. I do not care. So, I'm not saying that we're not going to get tired. But true devotion is going to pick yourself back up and keep going and keep trying. Just continue on. Some of the other things that I've been trying to um, process is the duty of parents is to sustain a child's inner life with ideas as they sustain his body with food. And from infancy, the child is watching and observing. What ideas are we giving in their little minds? And I try to think about exactly what my kids are seeing in a day-to-day -day, you know from from their point of view what do they see me doing I can tell you right now like I I get scared to think of that like I really do because some of the things that I struggle with is more like a shame of what I'm doing mm -hmm. So, for example, I'll get up early in the morning and it's like, guys, I will feed you. I will do anything. I just need a cup of coffee and like 15 minutes on my phone just to kind of wake up. And I don't, I don't want to be that mom. I really don't want to be that mom that's like first thing on the phone. I've never wanted to be that mom. And I just got into a really bad habit. Cup of coffee? Absolutely. But you know what? <sighs> I need more than just scrolling through Instagram or Facebook and feeling already defeated about who I am in a brand new day. Lord's mercies are new every day and already I would feel defeated because of how um, everybody else is and I'm not. And that's not what I need for sing in the morning because it already feels like a failure that day. I know so many people that give up social media, and I'm not saying that it's bad or wrong or that it's good. I'm saying I totally understand, and there's some days when I'm like, I think I need to be in that boat. But right now is not that time. And I've really contemplated that, and I've really given that a lot of thought, and no, right now is not that time. So... It's time to change how we, how I start my morning because that's not the idea that I want to present to my children. Wake up, grab the phone, and grab your cup of coffee. First idea that I want to give my children is wake up, grab a cup of coffee. I like it better with something warm. Like if warm water was good, then I would probably wake up with warm water. But I don't find warm water particularly delightful. So I'm going to grab my coffee. And tea is just water. Like flavored water. So I want coffee. It's creamy. It's delicious. But let me grab my Bible instead. And that's actually... Actually, I'll be honest. That one's a little bit difficult for me. Because if I get up and grab my Bible... like. I know I'm glazing over it because I am not awake to really pour into myself his word. But maybe because the idea of me ever getting up before my kids is hardy har har. I wake up at 5.30, they'll be up at 5.35. I wake up at 5, they're going to be up at 5.10. I wake up at 6.30, they'll be up at 6.35. It's, it's, that's just how it works. So, yeah, no, me getting up before them is not going to happen. So, um, but maybe I could just get up with my cup of coffee and have a conversation with them. That would be just fine. That's a great idea. I'll be honest that. 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. That's not going to be the first thought on my mind, though. It's going to be, how do I stay awake? I'm not supposed to get on my phone. I'm supposed to take um, coffee and have a conversation. But anyway, like, going back to the ideas. What are, what ideas am I putting in front of my child? Um, another section that she goes into after that is 
basically fortifying our kids against doubt. And that is definitely in more of a Christian thing. Basically, she kind of, it's, it's interesting to me, again, going back to um, thoughts and stuff. At one point, she's like, this is going to happen. This is to be expected. But at the same time, like later on in the section, she talks about just expecting our kids to behave a certain way just because. So it's, it's really interesting to me the, the, um, it's not like she's contradicting herself. Like if you read it, you would see she's not contradicting, but basically the, the two ideas that you kind of have to really contemplate on. But basically the fortifying our kids against doubt is I think later on in life, like when they become, um, teenagers and they're starting to build their own thoughts and ideas. She basically says that they're going to find a role model to follow after. And they're going to choose somebody else to listen to. It's, it's what they do. They're, they're trying to be their own person. But what's um, interesting about that is they still can't think for themselves kind of aspect. So here we go. Children will grow up and choose the leaders and thoughts they are drawn towards. Parents should expect this. And if they, the children, have not grown up in a rigid home... This transfer will be open and not in secret. That was just so hard for me to take in. Because I just, I, I don't know. Just, I, it, it was really hard for me to take in. Um, st like I said, a lot of these I'm still trying to process and deal with and work my way through and line it up with scripture. Well, you know, one of her thoughts is, in preparation for this transfer of allegiance, there is much to be done beforehand. Beforehand, so that you do nothing when the time comes. Parents can set up the idea that modern thought is infallible by admitting that they don't know and don't always have a wise-sounding answer. And it should be followed by the effort to know the research necessary to find out. So, I... I'm probably going to stop there because a lot of what's next I'm still trying to process through and take notes and then I go back and read it. Like Charlotte Mason, there is just so much to really um, gather and understand and I'm still learning. Like I'm, I'm not coming to you as an expert. I've said that many times. I don't come to you as an expert. But I am coming to you as a mom that's reading some of this hard books and trying to figure things out and sharing with you my thoughts and ideas. But on that note, I gotta go get the girls from ballet, so I will see you in my next video, and I hope you enjoyed this one.